Greetings and salutations, all you gorgeous individuals. Welcome back to League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties for the big one. The tasty preview of semi-final action at the World Championship. Two marquee matchups were guaranteed an LCK versus LPL final, which just always seems to hit a little bit harder than when you have those domestic head-to-head -head finals. My spidey senses, they're tingling. I'm feeling it this weekend. We're getting double bangers, full-on silver scrapes. I'm calling it right now. These semifinals are going to deliver. We are going to have the drama necessary to give us the finals we all deserve for this world championship. And it all starts with these two semifinals. And no shortage of incredible storylines on both sides of the bracket here. Of course, we begin with that T1 Gen G rivalry. We were denied a best of between these two in the summer playoffs in the LCK because your boys from Hanwha were beaten up on T1 not once but twice. But we are talking seven straight best of series that Gen G has beaten T1. Now we're hearing they've got like a 20 and one record against them in scrims potentially. And that, all that makes me go, that just makes me feel like T1's gonna win. If you put this exact situation down in any, any type of sport, traditional, esport, whatever, everybody is going to say, yep, done and dusted. This one will be for Gen G. No need to play this one out. It's not how it works. You gotta go through this one. And I feel like, again, a lot of people will agree with this one, despite hearing those stats. If that's all you hear, absolutely, you're gonna be in the side of Gen G. You've watched these games. You felt the emotion of this world championship. You know that this T1 is going to be a different task to topple for Gen G this time, this time around. Yeah, and if any team, even if they're doing that terribly in scrims and that head to head to Gen G, who cares? Look at their on the rift games they've had so far. They've looked absolutely terrifying. They're first among all these titans in the majority of the major statistical categories when it comes to teams. 95% of barons on the rift they have taken, which is like basically one they've probably given up. It's absolutely insane how dominant they've looked, how confident they've looked in these wins and Obviously, all the matchups are going to be huge heading into this one, but I'm looking especially at that bot lane and not the AD carries. I'm talking Kyria versus Lehens because I think Lehens has kind of not been to the highest level that we've been accustomed to seeing throughout 2024, and Kyria was cooking against top esports. Oh, baby, was he ever. And that is an X factor in the pocket of T1. It always has been one of these situations, but not necessarily a card that has been able to be played, able to be a factor so many times this year throughout the LCK. Now, when things really matter, when T1 has sharpened up at this event, when they look to have the handle on the meta this time around, and by meta, I mean not only what is the establishing and, and established and establishing tournament meta, but as well as their own path in that meta as well, like we saw last year at the World Championship when they were world champions. That is the T1 that is coming into that type of form for this matchup. And Kyria at that level, that creativity, that playmaking, that secret sauce that he can bring for T1, he's at a level right now where I don't think Lehens is going to be able to touch it. And, you know, immediately the next matchup you're thinking about, at least I am, is in that jungle spot because owner's the other guy who's leveled up to that world's buff owner, as we've seen uh, throughout this event. And Canyon has played pretty standard. So really, the question is, how many of their secret strats from Gen G did they have to pull out against FlyQuest? Was the Cassidy something they were going to hope, hopefully fall back on? I'm expecting at least one crazy off meta pick out of canyon in this series at the very least what you can take away from that series against flyquest and the way that gen g were pushed and put into desperation mode and looking at how they then picked out from that point well of course there's the comfort angle you look at how they played in game four you're going for the canyon nidalee world championship skin you've seen him rely on that you've seen keen sante of course 
didn't need an, a, an extra reminder about what type of frustrations that can cause out on the rift. And then you also saw in game five, push to the limit. It is Smolder coming on through that classic bit of comfort, that scaling option for someone like Tovi to take the reins. These are all things that I think you got to key in on, got to identify as, you know, a draft ideology of Gen G if you are T1 in your preparation on how you want to manipulate these pick ban situations to control the draft things. And you heard, I think it was Inspired talking about after their series lost to Gen G, their strategy when they were winning games was picking the heavier late game scaling comp and being able to play slow and know they would have the advantage in the late game. And the games that they were losing, you had Chovy on Cassidy and Smolder. And he said, as it's scaling, those are like the most infinitely scaling champions. So they had no chance when you got to 30, 35 minutes. And I think you could even hear, you know, some of the behind the scenes stuff between uh, game three and game four, right? When FlyQuest had pushed Gen G to that brink, to that elimination zone in the series, they talk about, look, guys, just you know don't take these options you don't need to risk this this and this in order to succeed in this type of sense we can take these more you know lesser risk options we can scale up these type of things that has got to be one of the strategies you're identifying on now scaling up does exist but if you look back at the t1 series against top esports I, i'm looking at my uh, imaginary watch and i'm finding zero time on the clock to scale because t1 was pushing at an incredible pace yeah and don't expect uh gen g to get rolled over in the early game like top esports did in two out of three of those games regardless of how this series goes there's a i'm saying zero percent chance that this is a three zero whatever direction it is i'm just hoping that this isn't a case of oh Genji choked when it mattered most, or we're flaming one person on T1. However this series ends, let it be both teams playing at an incredibly high level. One is just that tiny tier better. Oh, this this is what everybody deserves, right? We don't deserve to get Genji and T1 at the World Championship and have it be just a, a complete lopsided affair. One, you know, one of these, oh, it's all this and blah, 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 not even going to check in attention for it. We deserve the full set, the silver scrapes, the full clash of titans that these two organizations represent in the LCK. And right now, based off of their form, I feel like we're in good shape for that. That's not because, oh my god, they're so impressive at the very top. We've seen impressive, but we've also seen the mistakes. We know the history of both of these teams throughout this event, throughout the whole year. And I feel like this buildup is going to give us the showdown we've been waiting for. Pretty sure the last time these organizations met at the World Championship, uh, we're going back to the finals, guys. Like 2017, when it wasn't even Gen G. Of course, it was Samsung back then. So tons of history, not just between the players, but the organizations as a whole. I'm, I'm hoping this is one of the best semifinals we ever get at the World Championship opposite side not to be undone and i think people are sleeping on this series a little bit because rightfully so t1 gen g is an amazing matchup but weibo blg not only is this a rematch from the summer finals where blg 3-0'd weibo not once but twice in those playoffs it's a rematch of last year's semifinals where in mirrored fashion Nobody was picking Weibo. BLG were the huge titans to get to Worlds, and it's Weibo coming away with a five-game banger. But if Weibo somehow wins this series, Zhao Hu continues to just climb that Mount Rushmore of LPL mid laners. If you're putting all your eggs in the T1 Gen G series basket to be the silver scrapes, to be that series we've been deserving of between these two, as I keep talking about, and you still check in to check in on Weibo and BLG you're in for a treat because this series is also going to be that banger it's going to deliver as you laid out Shao who's got an opportunity to put himself another level up another big uh you know title to put into his career list for what he's accomplished in the LPL pretty impressive regardless of the actual you know award at the end of it when you talk about what he has continued to accomplish and, and, and show out on the rift throughout his career Weibo versus BLG it's not necessarily the you know oh it's you know this is nobody beats T1 eight times in a row against Gen G type of situation 
this is still one that has a lot of drama, a lot of personal fire and beef to this one because BLG has been denied by Weibo before. Weibo has been denied by BLG before in the LPL, and now you get the extra unique mixture that is being on this other side of the bracket, having BLG gone through as low down to the depths that they were in throughout the Swiss stage to still be surviving, and Weibo there and the doubters, people overlooking this side of the bracket, you better believe there's going to be some heat in this matchup throw in the added hurdle for you know Knight wasn't on the squad last year but he's never been past the semifinals at Worlds three different times he's been denied that first berth in the actual championship round so this guy's playing for legacy as well as one of the other premier mid laners in the LPL and listen it's a two LPL showdown. We know BLG, the highest damage per minute of any team at the tournament so far. They love to fight. And Weibo, to their detriment a lot of the time, contesting things they probably shouldn't. They are always looking to scrap. So I'm sure this one will start with some slow-paced three-kill game at 20 minutes. But as this series progresses, you know we're getting 20, 30 kills per game. That's unless Bin says, uh, move over, Mr. Shaohu. I'm in the driver's seat for this series early. That's where we might get a couple fireworks popping off uh, at this one. Of course, that is going to be one of the areas that is of extreme attention is what King can do in the top side. But I don't think it should be overshadowing this matchup we have down in the bottom lane. That is where I think the attention should be in this series and where you will find the firepower that we are looking for between these two LPL teams talking about your boy elk down in the bottom lane and how he has been rising in temperature throughout this knockout stage uh, knockout area of the event and then on the other side light someone a little bit surprising still someone that is overlooked despite his quality contributions and and clutch ones frankly for weibo to be where they are once again with an opportunity to go to the world championship uh, just a separate moment these these semifinals what it can lead to the stories for the finals is incredible because you either got you've got Gen G finally making it to the world championship finals off the backs of MSI and everything else and then losing the LCK summer to Hanwha Life then you've got T1 the incredible story the rematch getting back into finals after winning world championship last year and then on the other side it's BLG looking for that as you said Knight not able to get into that finals make it past the semifinals a player so incredibly talented and fun to watch needs to get into one of those finals for us to see. And then on the side of Weibo again, just like T1, you can prove all the doubters that doubted you were a legit runner up for that world championship last year by locking in a spot for yourself and a chance at redemption. Once again, these semifinals, I cannot wait for these ones to go down. The script writers have all four possible matchups, you know, <laughs> written out ahead of time and they're going, ah, I can't pick, I can't pick one that we're going to make happen, uh, go through. That's why we live in the multiverse, and we'll live all four in different ways. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the LPL side, I think BLG is still the more obvious answer than the Gen G versus T1. They're going to be bigger favorites heading into this, but we got to learn not to discount Weibo. This is a team making LPL finals in summer, making the semifinals at Worlds. This is a team in spring and summer that we were saying they don't even look like a playoff team in the LPL. And all this talk, it is still looking over the X Factor guy for this Weibo team in Tarzan and what he can do in the jungle. That is a big time difference maker because we've seen the full the full buffet. We've seen the garbage bin where everything is thrown in after it's expired on the buffet. And we have seen the ultimate crystal lobster tower at the end of it waiting for you from Tarzan. It needs to be closer to that luxury end of items on the buffet from him for Weibo to have a chance against this BLG Titan in the semifinals. All right, Mark, who is the finals matchup? What what part of the multiverse are we going to be living in this finals throwdown? I'm going again, the full silver scrapes. I think there is too much talent, too much drama and nerves will be on the line during these semifinals that we get anything but the full silver scrapes. And of course, I'm keeping the T1 fans in my heart. We're going strong. We're going back to the world championship despite all the crazy things that have happened this year. It will be the banger. It will be a 3-2 for T1 winning in the end. And I'm calling it game five. 
I'm going with a Gumayusi Jin performance Ooh. to cap it all off. A little bit of extra spice in that one for T1. And then on the flip side, you've got that Weibo BLG matchup. And I will not be amongst those fans denying Knight the opportunity to play for a world championship. That has got to be the dream. BLG, T1, that's what I'm calling. That's probably what your peak viewership numbers. That's the most you're getting. If that ends up being the finals, is that T1 BLG matchup. But yeah, again, either way, any of these matchups at finals is going to be absolutely insane. And I'm sure viewership numbers are going to be absolutely shattered either way, regardless of what team are making it into those finals. Not to be outdone, we still got off-season news before we even get to those semifinals. And, you know, the Jojo Pian bomb drop that he's going over to Mad Lions. Cloud9 has to scramble to find a replacement and they go, well, we'll just go to our favorite developmental league farming system. We're going to go to the NA Academy. Oh no, we're going to go to the LCK Challenger scene sounding like Loki is coming over from Hanwha Life Challengers. And now that's, that's two gods on the Cloud9 lineup with the God of Death and Thanatos and then Loki coming over. So I see what you're cooking, Jack. Uh, I think it's going to take a little more than just some name play to get across the finish line. Zeus is coming yes. next. He's roll swapping. Oh, okay. Now, now you've got my attention. Now I'm listening to that type of one. Yes, Cloud9 rumored to be going once again the LCK Challenger route. Berserker's not there. So, yeah, of course, we got to dip back in as Cloud9 into this type of situation. I think there's a lot of things to discuss about this one. Of course, one of them is the mention of, you know, hey, it would be nice if maybe you had an academy team. Oh, wait. Oh, we don't need those, right, Jack? Oh, yeah, that type of situation, Cloud9. So that's maybe why we are double dipping back in again to the LCK Challenger scene. And then it turns the attention to looking at Loki and what you are acquiring, what type of young player he is. There is an intense amount of potential there. There is hype. There is excitement still. Like a lot of these LCK Challenger guys, but not necessarily, I think, the runway fully yet to have proven it at that next step, that up-tier type of level. The LCS, an exciting playground to test it all out in for Cloud9. The one thing that left after that little, uh, you know, kind of examining, understanding, feeling out type of thing is number three. What do you feel about the entirety of what a rumored roster is going to be for Cloud9? Knowing Thanatos in the top side, Blabber, Loki... We've rumored to hear Zven being the one that will be signing with Cloud9 and then Vulcan down in the bottom lane. Not necessarily bad, but is this a team that is putting, you know, a, a lightning strike of fear into FlyQuest, into a Team Liquid? Heck, even into an 100 Thieves? I don't really think so. Not yet. Unless we see these performances from Loki immediately and from Thanatos have improved and shown us that next level, that next edge that they've brought to their career. Yeah, now on paper, this roster looks worse than the version of Cloud9 we just got with Berserker and Jojo Pion. But after seeing all the behind the scenes, all the drama with this team, it was clear they didn't they didn't click as a five team unit. I think bringing over a guy like Zven, who not only is he one of the most likable, hilarious dudes in the scene, but we know his work ethic is unmatched. And when you're bringing in two Korean players, who we know it's it's a different standard playing in even the challenger scene in the LCK than in the LCS. Then maybe you've got a little less for fun on the Cloud9 squad and a little more focus while also still going to be a cheaper roster for sure. And from my understanding, Reaper is still there with Cloud9. Again, another angle that you can go through. Yeah, I don't think these. they make this move if Reaper's not coming back. Right. Um so that's part of it. One of the, uh, the question marks that I've got, not necessarily a full on concern, is talking about, well, OK, you have Thanatos in the top side. And now you're adding Loki in the in the mid lane, kind of leaving Blabber in this island in the jungle between these these two Korean players, whether that communication is going to be a barrier is something that I would look at between these two. I don't expect it at all to really be something that's one of the little things that you kind of notice when you see this type of roster later. The LCS is used to that communication issues. <laughs> we've seen that, but I do like the point. I do like you bringing up kind of as amongst the players that we've had within the LCS ecosystem. Sven certainly is a grinder. He is a guy that does like to get his work in and does get to practice in. And again, bringing in another player that's going to have that type of expectation, that type of uh, atmosphere and workload built already in from the LCK challenger scene. 
I think that is a positive thing for Cloud9. Again, this is one of those ones where you're getting, you know, maybe a 7, maybe 7.5 out of 10 type of rating on this. The problem is you really needed an 8.5, a 9 to start swinging into the tiers that are where FlyQuest and Team Liquid are going to be expected to be next year. Other bit of LEC offseason roundup. Uh, you know, we heard the Yike to KC rumors look like those are even more fully entrenched. So he's going to he's gonna be kind of thrust into a leadership role now on that squad with two, well, a rookie in Khalees coming in and then a young player in Vladdy. Targamus, we know, isn't super vocal. So we'll see if the Yike training in G2 pays off. And then the other one is Noah didn't take long after leaving to Fnatic. Sounds like he will be joining Giant X. Jun might be over there to join him alongside Jackies. Maybe they try and get Grandpa Yankos, and all of a sudden, that team's looking pretty good. Hey, hey, look, as long as we're keeping Yankos in the starting positions for the LEC, I'm happy about that one. Because otherwise... I might start screaming and yelling, saying we want him over here at the LCS for a little, you know, uh, gameplay and content position. I think that would be pretty good over here. But yes, that is a good opportunity for him in the LEC. And one of these ones where we still know from what we have seen, there's, you know, maybe less year after year type of thing in situations, but more than a, a qualified player at the LEC level and one who can contribute and pop off and take things to another level. And again, combined with the young players that will be on this roster, that is the one where I think you're, you're wanting him to have that type of effect, to be that happy leader that brings everything together. And on the side of Yike with K Corp, I am very happy to see that for him. I think this is a wonderful another challenge for him in his career, right? If you weren't going to be with G2, still developing, still being un, uh, you know under caps and BB and all this type of stuff, taking this next step, next challenge, where you are required to be more of a leader, more of an active role, more of the front-facing charge of this uh, K-Corp lineup, I think that this is going to be a wonderful challenge and a good opportunity for him to continue to grow in the LEC. Great opportunity for him to separate from that, just kind of being along the ride for the Stack G2 roster. But this is just the beginning of rumors, and that is all the time today for League Unlock. Eric and Mike here with you, beauties. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.